Hello, I am teaching artist Lauren Welch. Welcome to our stream. I'm here today with Professor Liu, and we have for you today a very special portfolio critique by an art prof community member. And, but before we get into that, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, tutorials, critiques, and professional development. So Clara, can you introduce us here to Maya Hika's work, who that's their name on Discord, but we have, you know, a real person behind all of this. Maya Hika is here live in the chat. And they are saying, my quote, nervous levels are shooting through the roof. You know what? That's so common. Everybody who has a critique with us does the exact same thing. Just kick back, relax, and we'd love to hear from you in the chat. So let me just tell you guys a little bit about Maya Hika, who is from the Philippines. And the statement is in the video description below, the full statement. My Hika talks about how, quote, I find beauty in the ordinary things in life. I'd love to capture those moments in the story. And my Hika says that they want to apply for animation or illustration. And so right now they're preparing a portfolio. And my Hika, I believe you said that you are a sophomore in high school. And my Hika's goals are to improve both my observational and creative skills so I can be able to get into an animation school, hopefully to become a visual development or concept artist as an illustrator. All right, so Lauren has to log out for a sec. She'll be back. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But I will get us started. And Maihika, let me just give you a general overview of your work. I could not believe <laughs> that you were a sophomore in high school. My first assumption is that you were probably a junior who was about to apply, or maybe you were a senior who already applied. So I think in general, you are doing so well. So really, really nice job in terms of your overall approach to the entire thing. Oh, you guys still have a sound? That's strange. Okay, give me one second, you guys. Lauren says the sound is still there. Lauren, why don't you stay and what I'm gonna do, I think it's I'm gonna leave own. and come back, okay? Okay. So Lauren, you give the over. Hi guys, can you see me? I don't think I really can give the whole overview here. I just lost the portfolio. But so I don't know where Clara stopped here, but um, Mayahika or Maria, is a sophomore in high school. So you've still got a ways to go here. And I think that's pretty cool because I did not realize that this was a portfolio for, uh, you know, a BFA, let alone someone as a sophomore, not say like a senior. The, the work is pretty well developed. So, okay, the, the sound is gone, Clara. Sorry, it was on my end. <laughs> Sorry, <All right>. guys. <laughs> Sorry, tech stuff. Okay, so, I mean, I think you guys can see Lauren and I are sort of blown away <laughs> by yeah. the amount of progress that you've made for somebody who is fairly early in their career. And I would say, my Hika, in general, I definitely see the interest in animation and character design and really, you just need to keep doing exactly what you've been doing. But what I would recommend is start to really target and focus very particular parts of your skill set. Because in general, I don't feel Lauren and I need to tell you to work harder. I don't think we need to tell you you need to try more things. You're already doing all those things. So let's dig into the portfolio and start talking about what those really specific skills are that we want you to hone in on. So Lauren, how about this first piece? I think that this is a really nice study on how to hold an instrument. I think this is a violin here. 
I guess it could be a viola maybe, but so you're getting a lot of different positions of the hand, some foreshortening, uh, profile, vertical, and what would you call it, a three-fourths view. And these are great to show your ability to see and to understand all these different angles. The photo I think is not very good. I'm a little bit distracted by the dark edges and the way some areas are almost cropped off. So I would suggest maybe working on <clears throat> make it, maybe working on your photos as you work on developing these types of sketches. Photographing your artwork, it's harder than people think. It doesn't sound like a difficult task, but it actually does take a lot of practice. So I would recommend my my Hika just watch this whole video beginning to end. It's long, but once you've watched this video, you'll have everything that you need to know to get a good image. My feeling about this drawing is that, okay, you have the four segments. Oddly enough, the segment that I like the most is the small one, Lauren, the, the top part of the scroll. And here's the reason why. I think that your approach in the drawing here, it's a lot more about rendering and describing. But the thing is, once you put in the body and the fingers, there's an expectation that will have more of a gestural quality to the piece because the violin is very much about like movement and the sound. And I feel like this is more a still life approach in terms of the drawing mm -hmm. rather than something that really describes the experience of playing a violin. And maybe you can think about, okay, what is really my goal here? Is it to show the sound and the movement or is it just describe what does the violin look like? Yeah, I think that Neil asked the question that I was also thinking about, are these done from life? To me, they look like they have probably been done from photos. There is a sort of stiffness a little bit, I think, to the image up in the upper right-hand corner here. And also, I think some of these poses are a little bit difficult to hold over time, but... I don't think that there's anything wrong from that. I study from photos all the time for hands and things. If you do the drawing marathon, you've also had that experience of using lots of photos. I think though that Clara is right. If you are doing something that is about the experience of playing the violin, you maybe want to see videos or want to see that thing in motion. Whereas these images here feel very still. They feel like they're about the object and about getting the the different sheens on the wood or the, the detailing on the scroll, as you said. So that is what is placing that into that still life category. Yeah, like this comment from Neil who says, oddly enough, the violin feels more alive to me than the figure. So ask yourself before you start a piece, like what am I really after here? What is my intent with the piece? Okay, how about this piece, a bunch of gesture images of this quick dance study, Lauren. This looks like it's a study for maybe an animation of dancing. You could string these together and it would show uh, a certain movement. And I would love to see that part of it as well, if it is. The one thing that is really getting me here is there is a fold in the paper and it hurts me so much because you, you've worked fairly hard on getting all of these poses to be fluid and that is distracting from the work. I mean, it's fine to do crummy sketches that you toss around. I got a bunch of those <laughs> sitting in my office, but when you are preparing your portfolio, presentation is very important. Now, getting into the artwork, I like the idea behind this piece, but I feel that it's more about tracing the figure then it is about capturing the movement. And I'm gonna guess it's supposed to be about the movement because you have so many of them, they're not drawn in hyper detail or rendered. And so I think you need better references, Maya Hika. So this is the stream I did really recently where I did gesture drawings, two minutes from the Mewbridge book, The Human Figure in Motion. These are phenomenal. They have such cool poses and gestures. I don't know where you got this image, but I feel that maybe the image was not that great. What do you think? Yeah, I think that without having a sense of, of the body underneath, 
the pants, for instance, can feel very noodly. I get I get a noodly sense from this, especially say the one all the way to the right here, or the third one in from the from the left. And so we want to see you maybe tighten up some of those areas that feel like, oh, noodly can be a style, but it can also mean that you don't understand that stuff happening underneath. Well, I do feel looking at the drawing that you're drawing the pants, but you're not really thinking about the legs inside the pants. I mean, drawing clothing is hard for that reason because you have to show that structure and then the clothing around it. But you got to think more about what's inside the figure as opposed to just what you're seeing on the surface. My Hika, our artist, is saying these gesture drawings are actually from dance videos and it was at a low quality. So that's also something to consider as well. Maybe this was something that was just done for fun, but the quality of your videos can impact the quality of your work because you just have less information to work from if it's if it's fairly low quality. So uh, this these things that you offered here, Clara, with these videos, that's super useful. Your references make a big difference, you guys. If you have crummy references, it's almost like you're going in already behind. So take the time, find those references. We have a lot of reference photos on our Flickr page. We have a lot of them for our draw along. So use those because it's gonna save you time. Okay, how about the squash study, Lauren? I think the squash study is gorgeous. I mean, the color just, it, it makes me feel so wonderful and warm inside. That's a beautiful, orange shifting to yellow. I just really love that gradient. I think that it contrasts really nicely with the white of that cloth and the really light peach and Naples yellow color hitting the body. I get a great sense of lights and darks in this piece. Yeah, the luminous quality of that yellow in the background, it's so seductive. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is going to be a frustrating comment, Maihika. I like the background better than the figure. And I say that fairly often to a lot of people. And I think this is why. I think when people are doing a figure painting like this, the mindset is, oh, the figure is the main event. I have to do a good job on the figure. And oh, background, whatever, let's just fill it in. But sometimes when you care less, you do better. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, the point there, Clara, is to, to be thinking about subject and background and working on them at the same time. You always, you always work at them and try to balance them off of each other. You don't just say, do the background and then do the figure or do the figure and then do the background. I'd say at least in this situation, we, we, we harp a lot on you guys about getting your backgrounds and really getting good backgrounds. And so I really appreciate here that my Hika has listened to all that and has got a great background. So now the next step in all that is just thinking about your image hierarchy and how these things continue to play off on each other as you are creating the image. Well, so Basil says the wall in the background is so good. It's a good balance of interest while still adding enough to support the figure. And Vishaka says, I like the turn in the body, the bit of twist it has at the hips. Yes, that's a beautiful area. Do you guys see that little piece of compressed flesh that's underneath mm -hmm. the armpit on the left? Like there, I, I feel compression in that space. That's wonderful. Cool. Now... <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Time? I think we're going to talk about the same thing. Oh, you know? okay. Well, <laughs> what I was going to say is that the feet look like they're made out of Play-Doh. And what I should be seeing there is the Achilles tendon and the heel, which is an area of a lot of tension in a figure. Oh, uh, okay. Then I was close because I was going to mention the feet, but I was first going to mention that hand, which feels like the tightest thing in this whole painting. It feels like you just made this painting to try to make the correct hand. And in trying to do that, the hand feels like it doesn't belong in the painting. It feels super flat because it's so articulated. You have a black outline around the entire 
hand and fingers. And so here is the extreme of what we were just talking about, where you are so concerned about making a good hand that the rest of the image just comes together for you. You're able to just paint it and it comes out beautifully and then you really get choked up on the hand. We've got some really great comments. Michael says, I'd like to see more variation in the brush strokes in this piece, specifically in the figure. And what you can do, Maya Hika, is try to use a broader range of sizes of brushes. Use some brushes that are so big that they make you uncomfortable. Try not to rely on the little tiny brushes, which tend to make people very picky. Yes, Jill, this is a diaper fold. I'm so proud you guys did your homework this week. And Lauren, Linda has a question. How could the figure be changed to fit the background? I think right now, first of all, the figure is cropped fairly awkwardly within the background. The top of the head is hitting the top of the page in a way that's, I think it's called a, a tangent or an awkward tangent or something like that. And similarly, the feet are just almost, almost hitting that bottom. So we feel a little bit claustrophobic in here. So scale is a really easy thing right off the bat. I also think that maybe maybe he could, could take some some leads from duality that's going on here where there's that really light area of yellow, that mark of yellow on, on the wall there that really shines through. And then you also have that light patch of the back that also shines through. So there's this duality, this balance going on there that works very well. And I would like to see maybe a similar type of balance being struck between that dark corner there and the folds and the chunkiness of the folds on the fabric. Maya Hika says, I actually still have to study the feet and hands. It's one of those things that's very intimidating to draw, but this figure drawing really got me challenged. That's really common, Maya Hika. A lot of people are like, yeah, this figure's got their hands in their pockets. People do that for a long time, but yeah. it's time for you to start tackling those areas because it's actually starting to interfere with some of the other parts of your painting. All right. How about this one, Lauren? Again, a really cool study of these hands. I'm glad that you're working on this. Most artists don't, as we've just talked about. I think that the colors in the background are not necessary. They're a bit distracting. I don't really know how they necessarily add to the work because you're not working on a uh, positive or negative space here, really. You're more working about um, on different hand positions. Uh, and then another thing is keep mentioning this, probably need a better photo. This one feels very, very dark. My Hika, can you tell us what kind of pencil are you using to do these sketches? Because I find that a lot of people don't realize the range of graphite tools that are out there. For example, when I do graphite, I use graphite powder. I use these graphite chunks, these cube shaped pieces of graphite. If you just used your run of the mill pencil, especially the hand on the far right, it's so much more work to do that tone because you have to take the pencil and just fill, fill, fill. But with a piece of graphite that's more shaped like a piece of charcoal, you can be more efficient about that. So you might look into trying to diversify your graphite tools because right now it does feel like that's limiting you a little bit. I agree with you on the background, Lauren. It just feels so out of place. And you're the color expert here, Lauren, but my feeling is that if you have a black and white rendered image next to anything colored, the black and white can't compete most of the time. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. There are ways to do it, but I think first you just have to start really with the basics. You could use a color, I'd say. You could use a sepia color or maybe even a dark blue or something and you can balance that with some of these, these gray tones that you have going on in the hands. You can even bring a single color, a couple more neutral colors into the hands themselves. And that's a way to say, hey, I'm working with black and white, but I'm still getting a little bit of color in there. But also, I think, again, that would be a great opportunity for learning how to unify backgrounds with subjects. You can do some figure ground relationship stuff there. So you're on your way, but I would just pay more attention 
to planes that you see, like the third hand from the left. Lauren, do you see that plane of shadow that's going across this section? Mm -hmm. I love that little patch of yeah, tone. That's great. One more of that and fewer fingernails. Because <laughs> the fingernails, you've spent so much time like really making them clear, but they're actually not that helpful in the scheme of things. Well, so try to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the outlining. And that's what we tend to do with fingernails is we see, oh, it, it's actually an outline on my finger. I'm going to draw an outline. And that's not actually what is happening in real life. And it gets very frustrating. And I see whenever you've, you're going into those tiny fingernails there, you start outlining around the whole finger. So it also kind of establishes bad habits, I think, once you start thinking about fingernails. So my Hika took advantage of our reference images of hands that are on our free reference photo collection on Flickr. And Neil wants to know, how do you feel that your hands might be featured in tons of art school portfolios? I never thought about it that way, Neil, but I guess I like the idea yeah. of being immortalized in that way. <laughs> so check out this stream, guys. This is a gesture drawing stream on hands. I do demonstrate many graphite tools. This will help you. Wait, so there's one more thing from Neil that I thought was really smart. You've only got graphite pencils. Um, you can sharpen your pencils to be very, very, very sharp. So you've got lots of graphite around and then you can use it on the edge and get a, a wider brush stroke or pencil stroke, I guess. And that can also save you some, some it can be more efficient. Guys, watch the Kathy Speranza video if you want to know how to really sharpen a pencil. That tutorial will <laughs> show you guys how to do that. Okay, Lauren, how about this watercolor? I think that it is really nice to see some more landscape type work in your portfolio. It gives you a lot of variety. This one, I think the, I like the different types of mark making going on. I do feel like it gets maybe a little bit muddy, especially towards the right where there's a bit of this overexposure and the greens are kind of melding in with some of the reds. So, I mean, watercolor is very difficult, Clara. What is, what is your experience? Cause you're the watercolor oh, right here. Well, I struggled with watercolor for years and I just got back into it with the Utah tutorial and mm -hmm. it's hard. It's so difficult to control. My Hika, <clears throat> what helped me was learning how to do dry brushing, which is basically where your brush has watercolor in it, but the brush isn't like sopping wet with water. And I just found that dry brushing is a lot easier to control. Like when your brush is really like wet, it's just blobbing everywhere and you can't really control it that well. So if you have a combination of those two things, some parts that are all watery and then some parts that are more dry and, and stiffer in marks, that can give you a little bit more structure and a little bit more articulation because watercolor just looks that way. If you don't try hard to give it a harsher mark, it just looks really, really blobby. And that's what you're fighting against with watercolor. Yeah, that <laughs> watercolor is one of those things where you have to let the 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 water, the moisture dictate what it is you're going to do. Otherwise, it just ends up a, a big, big mess. I love that idea of using dry brush strokes to bring out some some sharpness and some foundational feeling. I think that would help a lot with the contrast, both the uh, shape types of contrast and the color contrast or tonal contrast. Maya Hika says, I definitely got used to wet on wet techniques for my past paintings. This was painted on site, so dry brushing was really challenging. Maya Hika, I have to tell you, I think it's so great that you're painting on site and you're doing watercolor, even though your ultimate goal is to work as an animator or an illustrator because a lot of people think oh well I want to do character design I guess I better just practice character design I don't need to do watercolor painting or plain air that's not relevant why is being more well-rounded helpful Lauren regardless of what field you go into 
I think that it gives you more tools to work with. It can make you more experimental, come up with new and surprising ways of combining things that other people wouldn't think about. Immediately when I think of character design or animation or any moving image type stuff, I think of Miyazaki's work, for instance, which has great elements of character design, but think of those backgrounds, those beautiful, lush, watercolory type backgrounds in those Studio Ghibli films. They're amazing. So I think working in a bunch of different mediums gives you a better understanding of how really complex projects come together as a whole. I'll tell you, I really like these two studies though. And I can't believe that they're digital. I really thought they were gouache paintings, Lauren. Yeah, they, they are so gorgeous. They have a beautiful saturation and also ease to them. These feel like they were really easy to make. And I know when I get that feeling when they're easy to look at that that artist really has a mastery in that area because that, that is hard to do. That like These are just very, very lovely. I mean, it looks like you had fun. I, I see you looking at those clouds and being entranced by them. Because you know what, you guys? We can tell when you're bored. We can tell when you're working on a drawing and you hate it, or you're yeah. saying, oh, I don't need to do landscape. This is boring. I just need to get my homework done. You have to find a way to make things fun. You have to find something in that scene to hold on to that's going to get you excited. And I think, Maya Hika, that's exactly what you did. Now that's sad though, I want to see you do gouache. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so it's it's not like you have to do gouache, but considering you're already doing watercolor, you need to add gouache to your skill set. I think it's also gonna help improve your watercolor skills to also learn how to use gouache. Well, and another thing you can try also, Maya Hika, I know that Alex Rowe our resident gouache expert, he said he really thinks about watercolor and gouache as going hand in hand. He doesn't really look at them separately. So you might try doing some mixed media pieces where you're combining both. Like a lot of people, they do most of it in watercolor and then they use a little bit of gouache to beef up a couple of passages. So you might experiment with that. Okay, how about this digital still life? This still life is a great first pass at doing a still life, but I really think that you need to make a still life that interests you. This looks like a still life that someone gave to you either as an assignment to say, I want you to do the sheen of the pot and some fruit and the pattern on the bowl and not one that speaks to a, a history of you or the things that you are interested in and the way that those uh, digital pieces that we just looked at, those landscapes, those really felt like you enjoy them, that you love them. This one feels more like, oh, I, I, I need to have a still life in my portfolio. I used to give a project to my intro to painting students where I said, do a self-portrait as a still life so that every object you choose is somehow representative of who you are. And some people will just say, oh, well, I'll just pick my favorite things. But I think when that assignment gets exciting is when you start to think about it on a more metaphorical basis. Like some people are like, well, sometimes I just feel like a potato sitting around. <laughs> yeah, So you can make it have more of a story. Because I agree with Lauren that there's just a I'm bored mindset in this piece. Every time a an artist makes a still life that they just complete for an assignment to fulfill the assignment, the entire genre of still life cries and rolls around in its grave. Still life is the best genre of all of the genres of painting and it is so undervalued and you can make it that fun thing. You can elevate still life to the level that it's meant to be. You just gotta pick the objects that speak to you. So Neil is asking, what is that white thing beside the fruit? I was wondering the same thing. And my Hika says, it's actually just a small character avatar just for fun. So do that. Yeah. Have your character invade this boring still life and make the piece about that. 
Yeah. And also on that note too, some ways that you could get into this, if you're not interested in objects, not every person loves things. I get that. You could go really crazy with say the contrast on this right now. Everything is very mid tone level to dark level. What if there were some crazy light things happening in there that made the objects feel more monumental than they otherwise would be or felt scary or felt hopeful. I, I would really think about how, how lighting situations or texture situations could add a, a more of a narrative to this. This is such a cool suggestion. I'd like to see more of the little characters, says Mossy. What if this is a still life and there's 20 characters and they're crawling all over the objects and they're under the table? Like that would be an yeah. awesome still life. I so love my Hika, do it. Show <laughs> us your characters. <laughs> okay, how about this one, Lauren? So this is kind of cool. This looks like it is a cover for either a manga or a uh, film or something like that. I think that I would love to see the text maybe a little bit better integrated with the style of the character. It feels like there are two images going on here almost for me. My Hika, I'm wondering about your preparation process here. Number one, did you do thumbnails? And number two, if you did do thumbnails, were those words in the thumbnails? Because oftentimes for stuff that has image and text, people think, oh, well, the image is so important. I'm going to just sketch out the image and then I'll throw in the text later on. And that's what ends up happening is the text just feels tacked on. It's not an actual integral part of the experience. I mean, picture Lauren, if those words were going across the forehead, how would that change the composition? Then we have a relationship. Right now, they're just in totally separate universes. Yeah, and that makes them almost fight with each other because I think that you do have two compelling images going on here. In the top, it feels like maybe a mystery novel or some kind of dark historical fiction based on the text and the dark colors that you're using. And then on the bottom, I have more of this character centric type thing of, oh, there's this girl in the dark. She's looking at something. I want to know what she's looking at, what the setting is. So I just have two different things going on for me. My Hika says is actually a cover of the last chapter of a novel for a school project. I didn't do thumbnails because it was rush. I only had two weeks to do it. Okay. Well, my feeling, my Hika, is you have to think about the storytelling and what do you really have to show? Because Lauren, for me, the best part of this image is the neck down because I love that gesture of the hand, the glow, the, but the face yeah. to me is really distracting. Well, the face feels like it is sitting within a certain set of style parameters and then, or trying to, it's very concerned with trying to get a certain expression right on it. And then the bottom feels more interested in, oh, how is this light playing off of the clothing? It's a little bit more holistically involved. I feel like this is a theme going on here about these integration of elements. But so that exploration of how the light is hitting these different parts of the body and that kind of environment ends up being really seductive in a way that the face is, you know, it's more stiff that hasn't gotten there yet. And I would take a look at this stream, Elements of Art Value, because I do think that's something that's not being capitalized enough in some of your pieces. So try to get a broader value range. Okay, watercolor and colored pencil drawing. This is such a cute, tender little drawing. I'm a little bit sad that it seems to be artificially cropped here. Like, I want to see the rest of the hand. I want to see the legs. I feel like maybe this is an image in your sketchbook and you don't want to show us the rest here, but I want to see the rest because it's so delicately done so far. 
I think it's got a beautiful gesture. I love the bluish shadow that's underneath the clothing. Like that's yeah. got beautiful depth in mm. that one space. The hair has a lovely feeling of gesture to it. I actually like that the hair is more dramatic than the face. And yeah. so this is a great example. You guys, the face is not everything. The face can show expression, but to me, the clothing and the hair is more expressive than the face. And so you did a great job in that section. For me, it's a composition issue. I feel like the leaves are just tossed in. It seems convenient that they fit right in between <laughs> the skirt yeah, yeah. and the arm. And I, I do get the feeling that it was somewhere else and then cropped. It doesn't really feel composed. Although, I don't really mind. I actually kind of like the splash of blue at the bottom and the splash of orange at the top. I think that they contrast with the body and the, that figure really nicely. And they add this believability to the orange and blue composition, light and shadow thing going on. Like it's really easy to go from the blue splotch down there to that really nice cast shadow of the skirt. That is one of my favorite moments. All right, let's take a look at, this looks like a sketchbook spread of owls and it's an ink and gouache. I love this and not because it's just birds. I think that this is, <laughs> I know, you give me all of the bird portfolios I and know. Continues, Sarah, it just happens. So these look like, okay, I'm gonna make the wrong guess again. Are they burrowing owls? That's what they look like. Um, why I like this though is not necessarily because of the cute birds. It's because this shows the most thought of your process out of the sketchbook pieces that you've shown us so far. It is showing us the research stage, the I'm going to draw some owls, I'm going to draw um, a, a personified or an anthropomorphic type owl, and then I'm going to go all the way to this character design, character design of a human with owl-like qualities. And then you show us some ways that this human would move in this owl costume. And I love seeing the different decisions that you're making from that research portion all the way to the human portion. It's fantastic. I love this spread, my Hika. And Lauren, those drawings of the owls on the left-hand side they already have personality. My favorite one is the one at the bottom that's like peeking, but it's like, it's like totally staring at me. And so my feeling is you saw some personality in those owls that you then carried into the character design. Because usually what I see, Lauren, is people say, oh, I want to research owls. Let's just sketch them. And people just make a physical description of mm -hmm. the owl. They don't make the owl have personality. And I love that part of the spread. Or they do the opposite, Clara, where they start with a human that they want to give owl-like qualities to, and they just add something really general, like, oh, I'm going to give them wings. Oh, I'm going to give them big owl eyes. And here, it is very specific. It is these burrowing owls, very suspicious looking uh, expressions that get transformed into this owl girl E emo, emo owl, emo owl. I, I love that too, that was very silly. So yeah, I think it's that you've gotten that, you've done enough research and you are invested enough in the subject to get that level of specificity that really engages the viewer. My Hika says, I thought of these owls as fierce because of their expression and carried that throughout the character development as well. Oh yeah, I'm not messing with M Owl. I mean, they are pretty badass. And I love the weird wonky skinny legs. Like this yeah. makes me think about, you know how T-Rexes have these like really lame sort of silly arms that are almost useless. Like I love yeah, yeah. the weight of the, the actual character. And then these legs that don't seem to have much purpose. <laughs> Okay, so we have two character designs, and look, it's got my name, the character. Oh, it's based off of you, Clara. <laughs> well, it doesn't really look like me. I kind of doubt that, oh, oh, but I never see my name anywhere. It's just, it's so cool. All right, so let's look at the two characters together. Lauren, how about this one? 
I think this is really cool that you are able to carry through within the same character uh, different expressions, I think. I think these are two different character designs, Claire. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about them together yeah. because they're related. Okay, I think that the second page is more valuable to me because I'm getting a better sense overall. I'm getting the, the outfit, the entire outfit. I'm getting the different expressions. I'm getting the way that this person holds their body. And I, I wish that maybe there was like more variation position in these uh, top sketches up there, I think, maybe some, some different movements. Um, and then the earlier one in the, yeah, and this one too, I think just more, more range of, of emotion. I think this is a great start. I would just love to see more. Well, so you have a bunch of different styles here, Maya Hika. So you have the three on the right that are pretty much a flat color. You have the one on the left that has more modeling, like softer shading in the light, but actually my favorite style, Lauren, do you see out of the four heads, the one on the lower right? I love yeah. that. Face. It's got so much motion and that shadowing is so intense and there's just a lot of, a lot of information coming across there that's like really, easy to get into. Well, and it's a nice midway point because my feeling is that the three on the right look quite flat. The one on the left though, I do feel that the shading is fighting the really clear cut line work. And I think that head on the lower right, it has very clear shadows. So we feel the light, but the thing is it's very bold. It really hits you over the head. And so I would recommend maybe exploring that style. And for those of you guys who wanna do lighting and character design, Kat and Jordan just did one yeah. recently where they put different lighting situations and it's really great to be able to see that difference in the pieces. And you gotta work on your clothing folds, <laughs> my Hika, because they're okay, they're not a problem but they can be more expressive. You can get more out of those areas. Okay, so Lauren, we have the storyboard. So this is the whole overview. And then we have, this is the top section and this is the lower section. So what do you think about this? Well, first of all, I find it very difficult to create an entire storyboard. So congratulations on being able to make something so extensive. I'm really interested in these movements with the red arrows and the blue arrows that show, I guess the blue shows the camera moving and then the red shows the, the action of the person. So I think that these are really helpful in here. I am having a little bit of difficulty following the text, uh, partly because of the way that it is written and then also just trying to like line that up with what is happening in each of the shots. But I think I got a general sense, a pretty good sense of like how things progress, which is good for a storyboard. Mahika, I'd like to know what this is intended for. Are you illustrating a story? Did you write a story? Are you trying to plan a short film? I think these look great for such a comprehensive storyboard. I mean, th this took work. Yeah. And Lauren, you notice that every shot is very different. There's a broad range. Like the last shot is this zoom in of these two gigantic eyes. But then do you see the panel on the lower row on the far left it's like two little tiny people great job yeah. in terms of point of view what i do think you need to do is clean up your presentation so first of all i don't think it's easy to see the storyboard visuals when you have a black background i don't typically see that for storyboards it's usually just straight white and then another thing is, like you said, Lauren, reading the text, having the white handwriting over the black, I just find that difficult to read. And then I don't know that you need to color in those backgrounds. I find the backgrounds make it hard for me to see what's happening in the visuals. I don't know about that, Clara. And OK, so I'm not a storyboard artist myself, really, but I've worked with Eloise enough times to see how she does it. And I think that showing the lighting situation is very important to establishing the shot. It's similar to all of these kinds of 
uh, motions for pans or or zoom in zoom out scale. It's one of those things that makes the uh, you know the story what it is. But the thing is, you're using so many grays here, or so much atmospheric type color that it's not necessarily really useful. In some areas, I can definitely tell what your lighting situation is, and in others, it's it's not. You can you can be more assertive about it. I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, I agree. Definitely show the light. I mean, that's a huge part of designing the scene. But I think it's what Lauren's saying is that the way you're filling in the light, it's very busy. It's like multiple strokes. So I think just like a flat gray. Like you, you don't need to see the strokes. Like that's not really necessary. Yeah, yeah. So it's just an articulation thing. It's not that we don't want you to put those in there, but just simpler is better with storyboards like you, you just don't want to embellish at all because you're trying to like really get to the point about what's going on now mm -hmm. my Hika's is doing great in terms of point of view but this is from the comics curriculum that kat and i did and this is a great example of how if all three panels are doing the same thing it's boring but if you start to really change up the point of view it gets really fun. So those of you guys who work in comics, who do storyboarding, this is such a basic concept that I don't think people take enough advantage of. So take a look at that. Okay, how about this digital painting? I think this is so beautiful. I love the sense of what atmosphere and emotion happening here. I love this, this dark and almost tome-like or tomb-like library, a tomb of tomes, I guess you could say. Uh, it, it just, the, it feels magical, this light emanating from this thing that this person is holding, the scale of the person being very small compared to this, these huge shelves of books. I feel like I could be right in there wandering around trying to find the book that I'm looking for. It's, there's a lot to look at here and I think it's done very convincingly. I think this is a beautiful piece, Maya Hika. It's so well composed. Isn't this a great composition, Lauren? Oh, it's so good. You've got the the perspective that Clara goes over. It's it's got what 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 uh, type of perspective is this? Is this one point? This is one point. Although Maya Hika, sorry, linear perspective police is coming into play. It's a little wonky at the top of that bookcase on the far right. So use that string technique that I went over in this draw along that I just did last night, because <clears throat> the thing about, especially like bookshelves, it's, it's gotta be correct. It, it's so close. It's like a millimeter, but it's enough that the linear perspective police is totally nailing you on it. So look <laughs> at that. It's a cosmetic change. It's not a big deal, but definitely go in and fix that because it makes a really big difference. And my Hika says, I did a lot of thumbnails after watching the thumbnail stream. It shows. Now, Lauren, I just I want to point something out because my Hika, you've done some art prof shares and we've seen very tangible results of you watching particular videos and absorbing them and getting a lesson from that. I just want to say you're doing everything you need to do right now as far as really taking responsibility for your learning. I, I believe there is something like that. I don't think you can be a passive learner. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that we can see your growth over time here applying all of these elements and you're still so early on in your art career. You're still in like stage 1% that to be doing this now is going to put you so many miles ahead. When you get into college and you start working, you can really focus on those things that make your work super juicy um, and not have to be bogged down by all of these technical things that you've gathered really early on. My Hika, all these little fixes we're talking about, the linear perspective, the anatomy on the hand, getting a better photograph, that will come. That's not difficult. As you practice more and get better at it, that will improve. But this other stuff, being responsible and taking initiative to your learning, nobody can teach you that. You've already got that. And so I just feel looking at your work, you can just do great no matter where you end up because you have such a positive, open attitude towards learning and nothing can compete with that. By the way, 
you got to look at George de la Tour. If you've never seen his paintings, he does beautiful chiaroscuro like paintings are all in candlelight and he would be a good example. And I just want to say, Lauren, oh my God, the books, <laughs> they're yeah. so good. And the books yeah. have almost more personality than the figure. So they're a great example that, wow, the background's telling more of a story than the figure almost. Can, can we have Mayahiko on to do a tutorial on how to paint or draw books on a bookshelf? Because <laughs> they kill me. They just look like, you know, lines for me when I try to paint them. And you're right. Each of these feels like a real book that I could pick up and look at. And I don't even realize... I don't even mean real as in super studied and all that. I mean, they have a logic and believability and care to them that makes them feel real. And Lauren, do you see the background on the far right? Mm -hmm. Most people would say, oh, that's in the darkness. Black. Yeah. You can see books back you there. You can up. feel the architecture. I, <laughs> actually, Clara, I want to say... All of these moments, really beautiful. I think my favorite moment, though, the thing that makes this for me is this tiny sliver to the right of this of darkness of this of this bookshelf that is in the way of our vision. It's so small. It's less than a tenth of the entire part of the image. And yet it's so effective in establishing our point of view as someone who is not this this girl or this person here is not aware of us looking at her in there. And I think that that is really amazing that you knew to put that there. Wonderful work, Mai Higa. By the way, if you guys would like to submit your portfolio to be considered for a pre-portfolio critique here on YouTube, go to rprof.org and we are doing a major overhaul of the website right now. And we do have a survey. We'd love for you guys to fill it out in the Discord. But you want to go to Art Critiques. And then there's a purple button, which will take you to this form. So if you guys want us to think about your work for a possible critique, we'd love to see what you guys are making. And we have many, many other critiques that you guys can explore. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And in a few minutes, Lauren and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel. My Heek, I hope you can join us over there because we would love to chat with you more about your stuff. Subscribe to our channel so you guys can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are <clears throat> giving us the resources we need to keep Art Prof free and accessible. And when you guys support us, you're not just supporting the operational parts of Art Prof, you're helping people who can't afford to pay for an art class. So this is a larger community effort that I think is so inspiring. So everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.